Namaste. We are Narayanan and Padma Komar. We are trying to think through a new version of the Takshashila Global University centered in Bharat. After summarizing the main points, we will discuss features of Takshashila and modern Indian higher education, some implications and opportunities, and then present our model. The research question is this. Takshashila grew into a center that lasted a thousand years. What might be a fo proper follow-up with at least a hundred year potential? What lessons can we draw from old and new trends? What is a forward-looking model recognizing constraints and opportunities? So some main points. The old Takshashila was relevant to trade, commerce, transport, industrial base, and the skills needed for those. We have heard all those modern words, but they were very new back then, and yet people recognized them. So we must also consider emerging and future trends, maybe far into the future. Their faculty were not employees, but more like modern doctors and lawyers, professionals. Today, the coaching tuition industry in India gets a lot of bad press, but yet Indians flock to those in the hundreds of thousands or millions. So what are the lessons? If I were a teacher in the Indian higher education system, I should be very worried. Why should students spend um, 40 hours a week sitting in my classes when their learning is really done in the five or six hours a week that they pay for outside these hours uh, with a tuition coach? Why should they come to me at all? So what are these lessons? Takshashila was truly cross-disciplinary, yet it was excellent in each discipline. How to do that? What can we learn from the NEP, India's National Education Policy? We will talk about funding models. Also, we must live in the future, not the past. So we must plan for sustainability. It might be a mostly virtual entity, not concrete and brick either. We propose a research-based philosophy to drive learning and growth in all respects. Takshashila was at the junction of trade routes over land and water. Entering students were the same age as today's university students, 16 to 25, and came with a basic education and spent eight years learning. All that sounds familiar, but life expectancy was only 33 years in those days. So these were not people starting careers. Many were lifelong scholars. Maybe some skilled trainees uh, came and went for shorter durations. It was a form of gurukulam with apprenticeships. Some rich people and the government invested money, invested a great deal of wealth. They managed exceptional skill development and continuity of their research and scholarship. The present university system in India is mostly a fee-based, undergraduate-dominated college system with central and state exams. Very little freedom for faculty or students for independent study or special problems research. Even PhD thesis are sent out of the country to be certified by quote unquote foreign examiners. Indian universities do not excel in the global rankings, uh, which were based mostly on US dollars, but they are now excelling in metrics that are based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, meaning impact on large numbers of people. This is great, but there are serious problems and opportunities. So here's our model, very simple. As Ravindranath Tagore said, we must strive towards a university that is not divided by narrow discipline walls, where the mind is free, truth is respected, and knowledge flows freely. The central core, is a meeting, a meeting place of uh, all disciplines, not, not a continuous faculty meeting, mind you. Uh, I have talked about this before. This should be an activity to understand our own history, our culture, and our technology in a pan-disciplinary endeavor. All disciplines meet there. That is the common ground. Some guiding principles. Improving comprehension is the huge opportunity in higher education it has always been there, and it is today, and it will be tomorrow. 
even the top scoring student in the top universities understands only a small part of a subject. You're kidding yourself if you, if you uh, tell your students anything other than that. That is cheating, not teaching. The ancients recognized this. So they started with a no-nonsense, rigorous rote learning, and they taught how to think. They taught children how to think. And then people digested and used the knowledge over a lifetime. Now, online or distributed learning is here to stay. I feel that the era of fine buildings with fountains and balconies, but no toilets, etc., is over. You can read some more of our thoughts here at Leisure and in our full paper. Here we compare the typical fee-based model with the research-based model. The fee-based model is in a downward spiral to doom, in my opinion. But the research-based model offers growth potential and continuous improvement. Of course, both have disadvantages and potential for abuse. Those must be monitored and uh, proactively uh, corrected. So in conclusion, and these are present conclusions, ongoing work, we are proposing a research-led model to generate knowledge, both for its own basic value and for wealth generation. Emphasis will be on graduate students who are able to contribute with selected undergraduates. Obviously, uh, not all universities can go to this. How are you going to get uh, good graduate students? if uh, you have only a very few undergraduates. Salaries will come more than 50% from initiative-based, externally sponsored projects through the institution, not consulting. Now that sounds like a lot of hard work, it is. But that's the only way you're going to multiply your salaries by two or four and get to globally competitive levels, face it. Online or distributed learning will be a big part but here we believe that content generation will be separated sooner than you think from content delivery. The reward systems must be carefully tailored for this. Think about that. That's a huge change. Ultimately, the teacher must be respected, but that respect must be earned through innovation and scholarship, not dictated and not based on buying popularity with children or with bosses. So let us conclude with a note of thanks to the Takshachala Institute in the USA for its continuous inspiration and the many discussions that I've had with uh, Dr. Adarsh Deepak, who was one of the pioneers of Dhanam, uh, which preceded Waves. A true pioneer, he was the founder of the Takshachala Institute as well, and this was his lifelong dream. Thank you. <laughs>